to take some questions, and then I'm also going to ask a question because that you have here is one if they apply for high level job and zero if they do not apply for high level job but they apply for the job right yeah but the problem here is you know in some sense you're convoluting both the things right because previously if i were not applying just after seeing this information i become more likely to apply so that is something that you're missing and that's probably why you're getting a negative effect for for the men right because it's possible that they they increase their uh, low level applications, but there is no uh, commensurate increase in the high level application, and that's what is driving the results here. So, let me start. I did some work in, uh, in Angola actually, like uh, categorizing the youth in, in their decisions. And something that I found also is that the household size matters a lot for labor market decisions. So I saw that you have uh, some women that are willing to commute more. Maybe it's because they live in higher households that they can do all the, you know, the home production technology that the, someone helps with that. So I was wondering if you have information about it, about household size and how this changes the results. Also, I don't know if you have marriage in the regression, and yeah, I just didn't see it. And uh, just a comment about what you mentioned about unemployment rate for high skilled. At least for Angola, what I saw is that there is a U shape between education and unemployment. I think that some part of the story is, because, is uh, regarding reservation wages, and this is actually something that you see in other countries that the unemployment rate is, say, you have this U shape essentially because uh, higher educated individuals can wait and are looking for a, a, a suitable job. So. Uh, do you know anything about the people who exited, who, who did not continue? Uh, how many people were there? And second, you could not apply for both senior and junior? No, no. Yes. Um, thank you. So in the pilot, we exited those people that said none. But then people told us, actually, maybe don't exit them and let them let's see what they do. Uh, so in the full experiment, they are there. I, I don't know the share of them in the study. Uh, I will check. But forthcoming answer soon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question. So, um, do you you don't look at wages at all? And do they post? Does the firm post? The, you are the firm. Does the firm post the wages? <laughs> ah, so the firms generally. So for us, we didn't post wages. So, but generally, you will see that sometimes they will post a, a range of salaries okay. on the website. Um, but oftentimes, they just don't post any wages as well. Okay, and then the other thing is. I'm not sure it's completely fair to call this an information study because of the words women are especially encouraged or encouraged to apply. I think you include it because it seems like an encouragement thing, which then might discourage the men. And I'm not sure I completely understood your comment, but the way that I thought about that negative sign on the men was they were taking it as a, therefore I as a man am not encouraged to apply. I have less of a chance for this job. That's the way I, I understood it, but um, I, I think we could have an interesting discussion later. So this is truly fascinating. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. I, I was wondering if there is any way in which you can understand whether these changes that you're observing are happening within firms or across firms. Is it happening that women, because if it's happening within firms, then the wage structure within firms is increasingly, uh, you know, separating men and 
and women's wages, which I find probably difficult to believe. So I presume it's more between firms, but I don't know whether that's something that, that you can study or whether you have a look at it. Yeah, my question was in line. I, if you have any hypothesis of why this is happening. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? If not, I can. So my question is, uh, when you ask why, do you try thinking about hours worked as well? I mean, these are hourly wages. I assume you converted everything into hourly wages. And so did you look at full-time versus part-time or more than 40 hours or whatever the tradition is in Germany in terms of work hours per week versus, you know, the super hour people? Uh. Okay, so thank you for the questions. Uh, well, in fact, it's quite related with the one that uh, I didn't present because this is like uh, my paper was going to finish here, but then uh, everybody was asking this. So I tried to explain more about this. Um, what explains that gender wage premium for male grew more rapidly than those of female workers? So um, why this happening? One thing that I see is what happens when workers are switching from, from different occupations. So I find that, uh, so in this literature, uh, what is happening and what I showed is that uh, men and women both are leaving the uh, routine occupations. But what happened when they switch? And what I find is that uh, when switching, male uh, workers get a higher uh, uh, increase in their wage. They, they, I, I calculate, I, I took a sample of uh, uh, routine uh, the, of workers that were initially in a routine uh, occupation and uh, estimate the, the change in the wage premium when switching and this is higher for men than for women. So that's one part of the explanation. And then if uh, we look uh, more deeply into the gender segregation, and this can also be related with the other question, is that uh, despite this literature, it's like considering these five world occupation groups, if we w go like deeper in what is inside this group, we see that most of these uh, uh, interactive occupations that uh, in which women are increasingly employed, which can be from manager to social workers, so these are very different occupations. And women are highly concentrated in this uh, uh, related with care occupations like social workers or nursery teaching, which experience lower wage growth compared to the other uh, interactive occupations. And uh, with the firms, um, I don't look at firms, I could, but there is a large literature on firms. And what sees is that um, uh, for low skilled workers, the sorting mechanisms is the one that explains more. So the fact that women are sorting into uh, firms that pay lower wages, but uh, for high skill, uh, the, the differences uh, within the firms are the main explanatory factors. So I think we can consider that there's something like uh, very similar going on here. If, and about your question, uh, I don't have information on hours work, just full-time, part-time. So I did everything to uh, considering only full-time workers. Then I have a reviewer in my uh, PhD jury that asked me to do some robustness checks with the, uh, the SOAP, the, which has information on hours work. And uh, I have quite uh, similar results. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So, very, very interesting paper. Um, one of the things that I would have really liked to see more of, and, and I don't know if this is maybe another paper or in this paper, is thinking about the role of political economy and historical institutions, right? Especially if you're talking about Africa and agricultural technology. So I say this because there is this very great book by Helen Tilly called Africa as a Living Laboratory, which I don't know if maybe you've, you've heard of it, where she basically talks about, you know, so th this is a question of where is this technology coming from? And she talks about how um, the British, is, you know, I'm gonna use the British in, in British colonial Africa, which I study, 
are essentially taking a lot of local knowledge about these crops, testing these you know, new varieties, a lot of the cash crops, the, um, the maize, the palm oil, groundnuts, etc., and then exporting the knowledge back to Europe. So in that sense, you know, this is very, and this is happening, you know, she says like it's like almost 100 years from 1870 to 1950. And so in that sense, I'm not really under, I, I, again, super interesting story, super interesting results. But, you know, the, 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 I guess inappropriate technology is endogenous and thinking about the role of institutions in creating the inappropriate technology, if that makes sense, I think would be really nice to get more knowledge on. Um, especially since then you can think of, you know, is it, is it actually that, you know, there's, I think from what I got from your presentation, it's, it's like a, an environmental story mostly, or is it actually an institutional story about where different technologies, right? So exported out of Africa, get to Europe, re-exported back to Africa, and then it's like who gets access to these markets? So there, I, I, you know, it would be nice to get like much more detail on that. I think there may be a richer um, or deeper story on the institutional context there uh, to add that. But thank you. Very interesting paper. Why don't we wait, 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 wait. Yep. Thank you so much for this research first. Uh, there is a student in my university that actually is studying the effects of the free trade agreement between Colombia and Peru with the U.S. And in the chapter about agriculture, there is a lot of, uh, say, parts on adoption of, on, on seeds. And in the beginning of the free trade agreement between Colombia and the U.S., there was actually a lot of debate and you are proving that, that the seeds didn't work in Colombia. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm just commenting on, on, on your results. I think that also in all this literature and the way that the free trade agreements sometimes are, are, are signed, there are some chapters that actually says you have to adopt this technology and you are showing us that this is not actually the best path. And yeah, I just wanted to comment and, and, and to say you thank you because this is super appropriate. I have uh, two questions. One is, I guess, comment. This very much relates, of course, to uh, medical developments in terms of shots and, you know, uh, drugs that are used to target only first world diseases and therefore leave other diseases. And so, as you know, Michael Kramer, et cetera, have proposed a whole series of interventions to suggest what might be a good policy to follow. Some of that is being done by the Gates Foundation, et cetera. Uh, the other thing had to do with uh, Belinda's comment, I think, about institutions. Have you looked at, I mean, this is very much economics driven. So have you looked at whether third world researchers uh, end up then also investigating crops or uh, technologies that are inappropriate because in the end, they end up working maybe in universities or in institutions that end up being focused towards first world markets rather than the home market. I just think it'd be an interesting thing to look at. Um. Yeah, uh, really interesting question. So on the first point about the political economy institutions, I think there's a there's a huge history there that we don't even touch. I just recently read a book, I think literally called Plants and Empire, about the whole relationship between, you know, botany and the growth of, of botany and actually the fact that there were a lot of British botanists who were doing the first kind of understanding of genetics, but they were all like close friends with slave traders because that was how they got their material from different parts of the world. So the story there is like complex and upsetting and, and there's a whole, wealth of information there. In this paper, we don't really touch on the institutional aspect at all, except to say that we try to do our best to try to sort of absorb that variation from what we're actually estimating. But you can imagine the whole range of reasons why where technology happens. It's not just that you know certain places in the world are better at doing innovation. I mean, that's a result of a whole historical process, which is related to coercion and all kinds of things that we don't really touch on. We kind of take the distribution of where innovation happens today as given and, and, and don't do much to kind of explore so much. Um, uh, where that comes from, where the knowledge that underlies that innovation comes from, but but you can imagine a whole body of work of work on that. Um, 
yeah, I think there's definitely kind of a lot of knowledge kind of taken from different parts of the world and applied elsewhere, and, and I think we just don't we don't we don't have we don't speak to that so much. One, okay, sorry. So yeah, I would love to have a longer conversation on that. In terms of free trade agreements, yeah, that's not something I know much about at all. So it's really exciting to learn that this kind of applies to that that context or, or might be might be useful in that context, and I would love to love to learn more about that. Um, in terms of medical development, absolutely. So like the Kramer and Glenister work was like a major sort of inspiration for this work, and I think is another important area where this really matters. One thing we really wanted to do here is kind of think about everything and how it affects productivity, which was kind of our goal and why agriculture was really useful kind of for that, for that empirical goal for us here. And the question of, of universities in developing countries and whether they focus on local as opposed to foreign technology, I think that was a question that we had going in. And it turns out, I didn't present it here, one result that we have on that innovation side is, so you could imagine that the reason that there's so much more focus on sort of rich world problems is that the whole world focuses on those problems because that's where the incentives are, where you can actually market and sell your technology and make a profit. What turns out to happen is not that mechanism, but instead the fact that like places, even places that are not themselves wealthy, or even in some places that have kind of weaker intellectual property institutions, nevertheless, in the context of agriculture, it could be different in other sectors, tend to focus on local problems. But just the large skew and kind of where the research is and how much is being, t is being done in different contexts is what generates these kind of super uneven focus across, across contexts and across problems. But, but you can imagine either way, and you can imagine being very different in different contexts. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. question of no one. So, I, I mean, they were both elements were really interesting. One that they, they seem to think that their salaries should be much higher, which tells you their reservation wages are too high. I didn't get, have time to absorb what the gender wage gap was. But in other words, do they want an absolute salary that's higher than the men? Or do they simply have a greater mismatch in terms of their expectations and what the market salary is? And I guess the next one would be a policy question. Three kilometers is very close. Uh, you know, what do we know in terms of policy interventions that would either, pro if you think it's safety, then it's safety. Is it really gender norms? I understand gender norms might be for the home, but the distance that they're willing to travel, is it mostly safety? Is it mostly lack of transportation? Or is it mostly that they have to then make sure they get home on time? to take care of kids or to do housework. Okay, to, uh, to respond to your first question, so it's in absolute level. So women, they do internalize the gender wage gap. They are demanding wages which are lower than what the husbands are asking for. Husbands ask is of 13,000 Indian rupees compared to 10,000 Indian rupees of the women. But the uh, but you know the mismatch here is really about what women are already paid. So the gender wage gap is way larger than they're expecting. But at the same time, I won't say that you know they're asking more because probably they have higher reservation wages. It's the return to their work and that's why they're demanding more wages. So uh, uh, that, that's the one you know, caveat we have. We are not able to disentangle whether it is the reservation wage or it's coming from the norm uh, because of which they are not able to you know, uh, ask for the same wages which are being offered in the market. Coming to your second question, three kilometer, yes, it is, uh, you know, it's very close. Um, but when we look at, you know, availability of transport, that's going to be same for the husband as well as the wife, right? Still, the husbands are willing to travel almost double the distance of the wife. So it's uh, mostly to do with the safety concerns that these women are facing. Because uh, yeah, as, a, you know, as, as you know, part of another study wherein I was looking at what happens if women get access to work uh, with, uh, close to where they are living, coming through the policy of Narega, which is National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, that provides guaranteed 100 days of work closer to where, lo where you are living. So what we find there is that women are differentially taking more benefit of the scheme compared to the husbands. So that in some sense validates that, you know, it's coming from the safety concerns that they have of traveling longer distances. Thank you very much again.